Yes? No? Yes. Am I on the left-hand side? Yes. Am I on the left-hand side? Yes. That's roughly through the middle, right? Mm -hmm. You're telling me that's on the left-hand side. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the letter. That's still considered a metal. Okay, it's still considered a metal. What is our left-hand side? Yeah. Staircase. Okay. And the staircase, I honestly don't even remember it, so we can color, color it in by cheating and looking at the wall. And there's our staircase. Left of that, metal. Right of that, non-metal. Touching that, metal lines. Okay? So cool. Um, you should have started looking at trying to memorize those. Flashcards aren't a bad idea. One side you can do the symbol. One side you can do the name. You will be adding stuff to those as the semester progresses. Probably within the next couple of weeks, you'll be adding some information to one or the other side, depending on which you prefer. Okay? So if you wanted to do note cards, it isn't a bad idea. Which gets us to chapter four. Right? Remember how I said I jump a lot? We're now jumping straight up into chapter four. We're going to look at the model of the atom. Okay? As a bit of kind of a warning, I think this unit is a lot of memorization. Okay? I don't think there's a lot of application behind it. A lot of it is just, this is a fact. You have to know this fact. This is how this fact talks to these other things. Okay? So just be aware of that. Okay? The other thing that I want to note, just because everybody started pulling out paper and pencils and all that fun stuff, is that these slides, did forget to check, I believe are posted to Canvas. We've got a hunter pulling up a digital tablet thingy. Are you finding the slides? Okay, so you're doing something else. That's cool. I was just checking. Okay, I think the slides are there. So, chem lectures or just lectures. It should be files, chem lectures. Okay, and you should see a file for unit one. Okay, if it's not there, I will get that up after class. All of the information on the slide, you already have a copy of. So, writing down what's on the slide, probably not useful. Writing down what I add to the slide might be helpful. Okay, so because we all did some reading, we've got Dalton's atomic theory. Okay, uh, I want to point out some kind of cool stuff. We got that nice little black box. I'm going to divide that black box up by putting a red box in there. What is that red box? That is the periodic table of the elements. All 118 of them. I don't think I can count quite right. I don't think there's 118. Why not? We hadn't discovered them. We hadn't discovered them yet. So when we're talking about the history of chemistry, we slowly build this information out where we can identify what these pieces are. Okay. As we identify them, what do we come up with? How many of you have identified me? You should all be like, yes, I have identified you. That's why you're not staring at the person next to you waiting for them to tell you about chemistry. You've identified me as somebody different, right? Okay. What have you done once you've identified me? Figured out your properties. <laughs> I'm going to argue you haven't figured out any of my properties yet. <laughs> and I kind of like to keep it that way. Okay, so you could categorize me as teacher. That's a good idea, coming up with a way to class. But aren't there other teachers that you have? Chem teacher. Okay. You have your chem lab teacher, your chem lecture teacher. So when you're walking through the hallways and you see me, you're like, oh, hey, chem lecture teacher. <laughs> hey, chem lecture teacher. Is that what you're going to do? Yeah, okay, that's painful. <laughs> what might you do instead? Hey, Mike, what have you done? Named you. Named. Okay. We come up with a way to categorize and symbolically represent these. We come up with names. Okay. Notice, what names did Dalton use? He doesn't really have any names. What is he using? He's using symbols, pictures, to represent the individual elements. Mm, that's problematic. 
Okay, we're going to take a second. Okay, there it goes. Uh, those symbols became his representations for the elements. What do you think? Should we use those symbols now? No. Why not? And I didn't say, are we using them? I said, should we use those symbols? No. Yeah. There's too many to create individual symbols besides like... 118. It's going to be hard to come up with 118 unique symbols. Why else might we not do it? Okay, which is a good point. We aren't using it, but now what I'm asking is why aren't we using it? Right? What you know about water. 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Write what you know about water. Try and be as brief and succinct and simple as possible. We'll just fish and see what happens. Okay, stop. You're writing way too much. You wrote the wrong thing. Hey, how many people just wrote H2O? Oh, cool. So some of you didn't write the wrong thing. It's not wrong whatever you wrote. Right? I didn't give you enough clue. But H2O. Okay. What is H2O? Water. It's our symbolic representation of that. If we used symbols like this, it might look something like this guy. Circle, dot, solid thing, circle, dot. How am I going to communicate that information? Pretty much the only way I can communicate it is through a physical document which is going to slow our communication process. So we came up with another way to represent that information. That's using letters. That's the symbols from our periodic table. Okay. Why did Dalton use pictures? It's a good question. I don't know. If you were going to pass notes, and you would never pass notes in my classroom, but if you were like in elementary school and you're going to pass notes, do you pass notes in a nice, clean, clear, understandable language? No, why not? Not quick enough. <clears throat> you don't want someone to see it. You don't want somebody who, an unattended audience, to see it. If we write symbols like this, what does Dalton now look like? A <laughs> child is one option. I was going to go kind of the other direction. A genius. Look at this crazy wizard. It's putting all these symbols together and making stuff happen. Okay? This is one of the reasons why people have bad opinions of scientists because they try to make themselves look really smart. Okay? Maybe there was a better system behind it. I'm, I don't want to judge, but I am. Okay? We're coming up with ways to represent that information, and one of our ideas is trying to simplify it as much as possible. Okay? So in his theory, okay, it also looks prettier, right? H2O versus circle dot, circle solid thing. Like That looks kind of cool. First rule. An element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. What do you think? True or false? True. What the time, what the time true, but not false. Ooh, interesting. Putting conditionals on the question. That's fair. Okay, we all did the reading, right? And in that reading, what did we learn about? The first two were that it was not true. That's a fair statement, so it is false. What we've done is now just reported information. I want a little bit of analysis. Why is that false? Okay. So you're saying that the rule is false because they're not indivisible. Okay. Valid. Can somebody else elaborate? Some people are like, yeah, I, I could elaborate, but I'm not going to. Appreciate that. What was that? That's too many letters. I think so. It's not a bad guess, but no. See, I did spell it right. We have subatomic particles. We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. I know I can divide an atom up into those constituent parts. So rule one of Dalton is wrong because we have evidence of smaller particles. 
And if we combine those smaller particles, we can make our atoms. Okay, so subatomic particles disprove Dalton's first theory. What about number two? All elements are identical, and they all have the same properties. Okay, so of course, what am I going to follow that up with? Why? So the most common one that people jump all over is isotopes, okay, which uh, I, it does make me want to go back and look at the textbook. I wouldn't be surprised if the textbook directly points you to saying isotopes is why it's wrong. Okay? There's probably a better one because very few of you are actually ever going to encounter isotopes. But I would argue a lot of you are going to encounter the larger reason for why that rule is false. Ions. You know, well, what does that mean? Okay, if I take sodium ion versus sodium metal, what happens if I eat sodium ion? <laughs> we got some biologists, right? Some people study a little bit of biology, like muscles. How do muscles work? Contractions. How do the contractions work? We're looking at basic science, so we may not have gotten there yet. That's okay. What's that? So ATP, but what is ATP doing to allow the muscle to contract? It's exchanging not electrons, but ions. Which ions? Sodium and potassium. We exchange sodium and potassium ions across a membrane. For me to live, I need to have sodium ions because that's what's causing all of my muscles to function. Without those ions, it doesn't function. Okay? So sodium ion is incredibly important to my existence. Well, it's so important, I'm going to take this block of sodium metal and I'm going to eat it. And instead of living, my face probably explodes the instant it touches my mouth. Okay, why? Sodium metal has insanely different properties, chemical properties, than sodium ion. They're both the same element, but all we've done is changed a small characteristic about it. Same kind of thing happens with the isotopes. Isotopes are different because they... How are isotopes different? Let's try it less leadingly. It's like the same element with different numbers of neutrons or electrons? Different numbers of neutrons. That's a phenomenal answer. Way too sciencey. Unscience it. He's like, that was the only answer I had. Well, this was a science class. Why are you telling me to unscience things? What is the difference between an isotope? That number. Number of neutrons, so the same answer, oh, that didn't work. Dang it. What do neutrons contribute to the overall atom? Oh, the charge. We call it newt for a reason, and it's not because it's a f cute little salamander thingy. What? <coughs> Positive and negative, so let's go back to that newt. Newt as in neutral, neutral which means... No positive and negative. So I like the idea of going to positives and negatives. That was the wrong path. So what does a neutron contribute if it doesn't contribute charge? Weight is unofficially a wrong answer, but that's okay. Mass. Okay, weight and gravity, and I don't understand it. Talk to a physicist. Okay. So mass. Different isotopes weigh different things. They have a different mass. What's the difference between ions? Well, they have different charges. Isotopes are different because they have different numbers of neutrons. Ions are different because they have different <coughs> electrons. If we different change the proton, are we still the same element? <coughs> no. So when we're looking at ions, we're specifically referencing electrons. Okay. Atoms of different elements combine to form compounds. True or false? True. Give me an example. There we go. H2O. Lovely. I take two hydrogens, one oxygen, I put them together, and I've got a new compound. Right. Compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. True or false? Could I write H 0 0.5, let's try the math again, wait for me, 
is H0 0.5 not the same mathematical representation as H2O? Mathematical representation. For every one oxygen, I have two hydrogens. If I make this a one, what do I have to do? Multiply by a two, which means two. Are these two mathematically identical? Yes. Okay. Is this a valid chemical notation? No. Which is getting at rule four. We cannot make that formation. Okay. They have to be whole numbers. Okay. So because that statement is false, or that drawing is false, this statement is true. We can't break atoms up into smaller pieces okay, to make a compound. Atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. Okay, so we ready for a horrible joke? I apologize. They don't, uh, they don't happen all that often, but sometimes they come out. Okay. Two guys walk into a bar. First one walks in, orders H2O. Second one walks in and says, I'll have H2O too. First one lives, well hydrated little human being. The second one dies. Why? H2O2. H2O2. If we look at H2O versus H2O2, different combination of atoms, okay, different ratios, and we get different compounds. H2O, our well-beloved water. H2O2, yeah, death. Let's focus on the less like deathy. Hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Used to like kill small bacteria and open wounds, that kind of fun stuff. Okay. So yes, those are two drastically different things. We get a true statement here. Make sense? So when we think about Dalton's rules, what we want to think about is why they're false. Come up with the explanation to explain this. Okay? It's not just, here's a rule. Make sense? One head shake, yes. Okay? So 50 years later, 60 years later, we get Thompson. Uh, and he comes along and he discovers that Dalton's rule is false. We said subatomic particles. Here's the first evidence of subatomic particles. We get electrons and protons. Right? Through his studies, Thompson was able to prove that we get electrons come out with a negative charge and protons thereby must be a positive charge. Right? I'm not 100% on this, but I might be right, maybe. Thompson came up with an experiment to prove the existence or to show the existence of electrons. Because he could now show the existence of electrons, he knew protons must also exist. But he didn't actually show they existed. How does he know they exist? Because there has to be an opposite. There has to be an opposite. Why do we know there has to be an opposite? There has to be neutrality. Okay, why do we know there has to be a neutrality? How stable are electrons and protons? Not very. How do we know they aren't very stable? Not necessarily. Their yeah, they would react. Because they have charge. Why did Dalton not discover electrons and protons? They aren't stable. What happens when I create an electron or get it in a space? It is now insanely reactive. The very first thing it encounters, what happens? It reacts with it. And what happens to the existence of the electron? It's gone. I can no longer measure it. So to discover an electron, I have to make sure that that electron is near what? Remember, if it's near anything, it reacts with it, and we no longer see the electron. So what must be near the electron? Nothing. nothing. What is nothing? An existential crisis. Just vacuum. A vacuum. Why did we have to wait for Thompson to discover electrons and protons? The technology to create a vacuum was not created. 
the whole discovery of Thompson's model hinges on the existence of, an of a vacuum. If we don't have a vacuum, we can't get the electrons to exist for long enough to actually observe that they exist. Right? And all we have is Dalton's theory that they can't be subdivided down into smaller particles beyond atoms. Once we have a vacuum, now we can actually see the existence of electrons. We aren't actually seeing them, we're just seeing evidence that they had to exist. Right? Which is really fancy and cool. So what we did is we took a glass tube, we pulled all of the air out of it using a vacuum. Right? And then we put some electrodes at the opposite ends of that, negative and positive. Right? If I put enough current in there, what are the electrons going to want to do? They're going to try and jump to the positive charge. Right? In the process of doing so, they will impact a few <coughs> atoms. That few atom impact will cause a glow. If we're really lucky, some of them will even impact the end of the glass tube, and we can see a glow at the end of the tube. Right? This discovery is looking at a tube that has a cathode in it, Right? And if we look at it, it's generating rays of energy because we're seeing this beam of things kind of floating through it. So we have a cathode ray tube. And if we were all of an appropriate age, we might go, oh, that's really cool because what did he just invent? Exactly right. We're not all of an appropriate age. That's okay. A CRT, a television. The first televisions were a sequence of CRTs, cathode ray tubes, made very minuscule. So when I wanted a pixel to glow a particular color, I fired a light at it, ta-da, there's my TV. Okay. So we have TVs, thanks to Thompson. Okay. Kind of a cool little process, but what this really gets us is electrons. He now has this idea, or has these pieces. We now have to say, well, how do these pieces come together to form an atom? Because right, we have direct evidence of electrons. We know they exist. So he says, poof, an electron has come into existence. I don't really know that I have protons. I just know that there must be a counterbalancing force that has to be positive. So for an individual atom, it is going to be composed of these electrons as little P word, plums, floating around in a sea of positive charge, or a pudding of positive charge. And we have the plum pudding model. Right? Because we all did the reading. Is that true? Mm -hmm. oh, no. no, it's horribly wrong. So why do we talk about it? This is the first concrete model. It shows us where we started. It gives us an idea of where we started. And ultimately, what we are doing is celebrating Thompson's failure. These are people that contributed a lot of knowledge to our understanding of the atom, and yet we're talking about their failure. Okay? So the point is to acknowledge that failure, and how did we grow from that? How do we move on? That's pretty cool, at least to me. Make sense? Okay. Before we go into like messing with Thompson's theory and showing what an idiot he was, we're going to look at Millikan and Fletcher. So because everybody freaks out at this because there's lots of stuff up there and numbers and exponents and things. So, Millikan, Fletcher, oil drop, charge electron. I know I'm holding up four fingers like that was four words. That wasn't four words, but those are the four concepts that you need. That's it. Okay. The rest of this is just kind of cool stuff. Okay, for those of you, I didn't write all that down. It's on a video. It's recorded. Go back and watch. Minute 23. Okay. So what's happening here? You seen those fancy like crystal perfume things? Like a little squirter. Awesome. They took one of those. They attached it to a cardboard box so they could spray the perfume into the box. The box smelled wonderful. It was fantastic. Okay. At the bottom of that box, it cut a little tiny hole. Okay. Such a tiny hole that only one drop could ever really reasonably fall through that hole at any given instant. So they go, missed. Drops fall. Why do the drops fall? Gravity. gravity. Okay, so we have a downward force because of gravity. Okay, they fall down. Okay, drops when they or when things aspirate, they generate a charge. 
Okay? And we can see this as a physical action as well. If you've ever taken winter greens and you put them in your mouth and they're real dark and you just chomp on them, you see the, whoosh, the flash of light. If you haven't done it, you should try it. It's cool. Find a dark room, mirror, all that fun stuff and do it. You get whoosh, green light. Same thing's happening here. It's a charge. Okay? So these oil droplets now have a charge falling through the air. Charge, 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 charge. Okay? Not enough to hurt you, just charge. Okay? And as they fall through this little hole, you get Fletcher on the end of a microscope staring at it. He's not seeing an electron, he's not seeing a proton, he's seeing a, an oil droplet just falling through the air. Okay, and as soon as he sees that, he spins a little dial. Okay, and the reason he's spinning that dial is that what they have set up on the other end of that little trap is they have a big negative plate at the bottom of that. What charge was an electron again? Negative. negative. If I have a negative plate here, what happens when that negative gets near another negative? It repels. Opposite charges repel. So that oil drop falling down sees the negative plate and jumps up away from it. Before it jumps up too far, Fletcher switches the dial a little bit so the drop goes, eh, I don't need to go up that high. And he does this big bouncing back and forth thing until eventually what happens? It levitates. We get an electric force due to the difference in the charge plates causing it to go up. What else do we have? downward force from gravity. We now know they're equal to each other because the drop isn't moving. Physics. And we come up with the charge on an electron. That's pretty cool. Okay. We're looking at a drop falling through a microscope. Dialing an electric plate. What are the odds that he's going to screw this up? Yeah, pretty likely. So he's probably going to have to do this a whole bunch. He's going to have to do it a whole bunch of times and calculate this number a whole bunch of times so you can average it out. So imagine you're sitting staring at a microscope with a little dial being like, there's a drop. Oh, God. Damn it. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, oh too much. Damn it. <laughs> you're going to keep doing that again and again and again. Oh, I finally got one trial to work, so now I've got to do it again. And you were probably talking in the orders of hundreds of times. And it turns out it wasn't always oil. They used different liquids with this. So hundreds of times with different liquids to run these tests. And at the end of that, they come up with this phenomenally accurate number for the exact charge on an electron. That's pretty cool. Fletcher did an amazing amount of work. That's really neat. He deserves an award. Okay? And that is exactly why Millikan won a Nobel Prize. What was a different name. Fletcher was the graduate student. Millikan was the primary investigator, the research scientist. That would be effectively you came into my lab or my class, and I said, I want you to work on this project for me. You did all of this work. I took your work, and I go out and publish it to the world, and the world says, thank you, Mike. You were an awesome job. What's your response? What the heck, man? That's not fair. Welcome to science. That is academia in the science world. That's what we do. Okay. Fletcher, to his credit, is not bitter, or I think is now was not bitter because I think he's passed. Uh, just acknowledge that this is the way it works. This is the way it still works in science fields. Okay. Some of it is more like the primary investigator says, this is what you're doing. Be my hands. My understanding is that Fletcher came in to Millikan and said, this is what I want to do. Pay me to do it. Millikan goes, ah, sure, go for it. And then Fletcher did everything. Okay. Millikan still gets the credit because he's the one that organized and provided that time and credit and money to allow that to happen. What does Fletcher get out of the deal? Recognition. Gets a little bit of recognition. Money and knowledge. The Nobel Prize all goes to Millikan, doesn't, and none of it went to Fletcher. When he graduates, what does he get? A degree. A degree and effectively a guaranteed job wherever he wants. Okay? Because within the field, we may acknowledge that the system sucks and we don't put credit to the right people, okay? or not necessarily to the right people, because the PI still does a lot of work. Okay? But that credit gets kind of displaced around. But within the field, everybody acknowledges how good Fletcher was with his mind and brilliant work. They give him credit for it, and he gets jobs. And 
he gets academic positions because of that work. Okay? So it's not a complete ignoring of the science. It's, it's there. But, you know, to add to more controversies, we get Rutherford's model of the atom. So the way I used to spin this, and then I took an English class that we talked about this on, and I was way wrong, but the way I used to spin this is that Rutherford hated Thompson, thought Thompson was a royal idiot, and so designed an experiment to disprove Thompson. Totally not true. Best friends. They worked with each other all the time. Okay. But it, it's cooler when people don't like each other, right? Okay, more exciting story. Why, based on the design of this experiment, would we think that Rutherford was trying to invalidate Thompson? Okay, so if Thompson's model is right, we have a piece of gold foil. Okay. So we put that in the middle. Gold foil's thin enough, things can pass through it. So Rutherford gets a sample of radioactive material that fires positively charged particles, known as alpha particles, at this gold foil. If Thompson's model is right, what happens to those positively charged particles? Because they're now heavy, positively charged particles. We have a mass for them. What is going to happen when they see that gold foil, when they see Thompson's model? Yeah, it, just goes straight it should just go straight bloody through. There's no reason for it to stop. Okay? And this is why I initially said that Rutherford was trying to disprove Thompson. Because if he wanted to prove Thompson, we have to look at how he set up his detection. Well, the detection is this big old silver thing all the way around. What we're looking at is, does the alpha particle come through? Does it hit something? If all we're trying to do is prove Thompson right, where do I put my detector? I put it just on the opposite side. Okay. Why? Well, the particles pass through. They hit the detector. It's clearly right. Okay. But Rutherford arguably had a slightly better science mind than that. And so it wasn't animosity. It was just science. Well, we don't know if it's only going through because we haven't tested out there. So what does he do? He puts up a detector that runs all the way around. Most of the time, the particles go sailing straight through. Good on you, Thompson. Some of the time, we see detections hitting way behind the sample. There is no way that that particle should have bounced. Why did it bounce? It hit something. Okay? And it hit something of enough mass and of the right charge to cause it to bounce. So it couldn't possibly be hitting electrons, because if it's hitting electrons, all it's going to do is do what? It's going to stick, so the charges cancel out. So whatever those alpha particles are doing is they're hitting something that is both positive and large. All right? That positive and large thing, he says, is the nucleus. All of those positive charges, one space. One tiny space. Why does he think it's tiny? Most of the time, the alpha particles went sailing straight through. Only some of the time did they bounce, <coughs> which means all of those positive charges are likely smashed into one tiny, compact little space. Okay? We'll come back to that in a second. So we get the existence of a nucleus. Ta-da! Kind of neat. One thing I like to do is talk about this beam of alpha particles. Okay. Where do you get alpha particles? It comes from radioactive materials. Radioactive materials were an active source of research at this time, okay. but they were highly impure. When we want to run science, we have to make sure that all of our variables are controlled. If I have an impure source of alpha particles here, Maybe I'm launching other things at it. Those other things could be hitting my detector and causing false readings, which means that, that source has to be insanely pure. Rutherford didn't have it. So how could he do this experiment if he didn't have that insanely pure source? He can't. That's where we get another famous scientist, who's not in the textbook, by the way. 
Marie Curie. Marie Curie is awarded a Nobel Prize for having purified a radioactive sample. That radioactive sample is what's used in Rutherford's experiment. Without that radioactive sample, we can't get the solid evidence we need for the existence of a nucleus. That's pretty cool. So Curie is now the linchpin behind all of this. And if she holds on to her work, we don't get the advancement of science. You just cure cancer. What do you do with it? Okay. We really get kind of two big answers that come out of it. What are those two big answers? To let it go to the world. Why? Because you're a nice person. Cool. Okay. You're trying to cure everybody's illnesses. What's the other option? Patent the crap out of it and then sell it to the world. Okay. I used to be like, well, now you're an evil person. That is horribly misleading of me. I apologize. Everybody's like, I was going to patent it. I'm, I apologize. We do need to give credit to the people that made discoveries. That's why patents are there. Okay? We're giving that money to them because they discovered something cool. That's, that's cool. The question becomes is how much does it limit science? If Curie held on to that, we could have limited the advancement of science significantly for that patent reason. Okay, so it is very cool that what did she do? Gave it to everybody. Okay, she released that knowledge to everybody and actually sent out samples of purified things so people could study it further. That's pretty phenomenally cool. And what did she get for that? She didn't get her name in the textbook. She didn't get her name in the textbook. What kind of credit is that? She also got rejected from the French Academy of Sciences where she did the research. Every nation has their own academy of science that says, you're a cool scientist, join us. That way we look cooler. What did they say to Curie? You're a woman, get the hell out. Okay? So the reason I bring up Curie, this is a phenomenal discovery. She released this information willingly, and she was still denigrated for it as a woman. Science needs to expand the audience, not shrink it. Okay? So if you're in this class thinking, ah, I can't contribute, okay? you can contribute, you just haven't been given the opportunity yet. Okay? Let's add to it because maybe, maybe she did get some credit. She did. What'd she get? She got a Nobel Prize because she's a freaking genius. That's awesome. Okay? Did she stop there? No. No, what'd she do? She went and kept working on it and kept working on radiation. And she did enough work with that radiation that what happened? She did get cancer, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> she got a second Nobel Prize. Okay? I believe there's two people ever to have gotten two Nobel Prizes. And I might be wrong on that because I haven't paid attention to Nobel Prizes in a while. Okay? One of them is Mary Curie, chemist, arguably physicist, but let's not go there. The other one, Linus Pauling. Also a chemist. Ha ha, see, chemistry. Take chemistry, you get a Nobel Prize. Odds are that's the way it works. Okay. This is the extra cool part about Curie. Her two Nobel Prizes, <clears throat> chemistry and physics. Two of some of the harder science courses that you could possibly imagine, she gets them. Pauling, chemistry and peace. Well, I mean, really, you just got to be a president and you get a peace award. That could have been a dig. I apologize. Okay. She's the only person to have obtained two science Nobel Prizes. That's pretty cool. Okay. And a female to boot. Okay. Fascinating history. I would encourage you, if you're interested in that, to go back and look at her history because it is kind of neat. Okay. That said, she gets this out. Information comes out. Rutherford comes in and says, we have a nucleus. Okay, so we want to address a couple things with this nucleus. Okay? Number one is getting an idea of the dimensions. Okay? We haven't talked about measurements and powers of 10 yet. Okay? An atom has a diameter about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. The nucleus is 10 to the minus 13. So 8 versus 13. Eh, that's not that big a deal. I mean, that's, what, 5? Five? 5 units? Close enough. 5 units. OK. 
right? If I married someone five years younger than me, that's not a big deal, right? That's, not, that's, that's okay. That's not a big difference. This is the problem with powers of 10. Let's, let's put this at a little more reasonable, okay? Let's make the atom a, the Superdome. So a football stadium. It doesn't really have to be the Superdome. Pick any football stadium you, you want to imagine. For that matter, any stadium you want, okay? Except an ant one. That doesn't count. The nucleus is a marble inside that stadium. A marble. That's pretty insane. The nucleus is insanely compact. Okay? And what is in that nucleus? All of those protons. What charge were the protons? Positively charged. Why did Thompson want to go with a C of positive and not a nucleus? Why did Thompson even say protons existed? Because they were the opposite of the electron. They, they needed to cancel out the charge on the electron. Why did Thompson not just say, well, everything's smashed into one little spot? They wouldn't cancel out the electrons. They wouldn't cancel out. The protons would repel each other. The electrons would repel each other. And in fact, when we fired alpha particles at this, the alpha particles hit the nucleus and bounce back. They repel. And if all of my protons are in the nucleus, what are they all doing? Put a proton near another proton. Repel each other. They repel. So Rutherford's saying, Thompson, you're wrong, but at the same time is now saying, take all of those things that want to get away from each other and put them all in an infinitesimally small spot. Does that work? No, that doesn't make sense. They should want to repel away from each other. So what does Rutherford then say? There has to be something else there holding it all together. That something else does not contribute positive charge. It does not contribute negative charge. Okay? So it has what kind of charge? A neutral charge, so we get the term neutron. neutron. Okay? So each of these particles has a reason that we discovered them, okay? behind where they're coming from. And they're all building off of each other. Okay? So Rutherford predicted it existed because I can't put all the positive charge in one space. Okay? That's where Chadwick comes along and discovers neutrons. Okay? And we now have all of our subatomic particles. We're not going to deal with anything smaller, so don't worry about those if you know anything about them, because I don't. There's our three subatomic particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. The last little fun bit of trivia here, Thompson started this off, followed by... Rutherford. Rutherford was in whose research group? You're like, I, you didn't say that. I know. He was in Thompson's research group. Rutherford was Thompson's student. Chadwick was in whose research group? Rutherford's. They cycled off of each other, which I thought was kind of a neat little bit of history. Okay? So to that end, we have electrons, protons, and neutrons. Do we always want to write out electron? How many of you have written out electron already? Why not? Okay, because there's a symbol. Yeah, I don't want to have to write it out. We have a symbol. There's our symbol, just like our elements. You're just as lazy as scientists are. Okay, so we always have to come up with a symbol. So when you ask, why do I have to memorize that symbol? Because you didn't write it down. That's why. Okay, notice we also attach some information about charge. Where's that charge found? in the upper right-hand corner. That's important, because guess where charge is always found? Upper right-hand corner. You mean we're consistent? Not usually, but yes. Where are they found? You have to know nucleus outside the nucleus. You have to know their charges. And then we get to the last one, mass. What's the deal with mass? Protons and neutrons, and notice with these Mass and charges, these are relative masses and charges. We could go to the exact charges you don't want to. So relative. For an electron, the relative mass is 1 over 1,836. That's pretty small. That would be roughly the size of a single hair off of my head. Right? Ballpark. I want to lose some weight. So I'm going to rip a hair out of my head. Did I lose any weight? 
Not really is a good answer. Like the tiniest bit. Okay. If I stepped on a balance and tried to figure out what my weight was, I'm not going to see a difference with that single hair. Is there a better number for the mass of an electron? So as a hint, yes, there is. That's why we're going to erase that. What would that better mass be? Zero. Zero. Electrons don't have a mass. Okay, it's not true to its fullest extent, but as a relative mass, that's a ballpark estimate that works for us. You need to know all of this information because what we will do is now apply that information out into the rest of chemistry. Okay? So, let's now scaffold this out to our elements. Your textbook references, this is atomic notation. It is one of the worst names for it because it is not atomic notation. What things are in an atom? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Let's take a look. Fish through there. Tell me if you see the word proton. Yes. Yes. Do you see the word neutron? Yes. Do you see the word electron? No. Aren't electrons part of atoms? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this isn't atomic notation because it's ignoring electrons, at least currently. What is this referencing if we're only looking at protons and neutrons? Nucleus. We're looking at the nucleus. So this isn't really atomic notation, even though that's what it's called. It should be better called... nuclear notation, because we're referencing the nucleus. Okay? Who might be concerned about nuclear? Okay, Godzilla. How did Godzilla become Godzilla? Radiation. Radiation. Radiation coming from? The nucleus. What element is radioactive? Uranium. Polonium. A lot of stuff. Where is that lot of stuff? Usually at the bottom of the periodic table. What is different about the bottom of the periodic table versus the top? One's at the bottom, one's at the top. Got rid of that one. Mass. Where do you see the mass? Okay, this becomes challenging. Okay. It's at the bottom. How do we know the mass is reported at the bottom? The key. The key tells us. Take advantage of the information given to you. The key tells you that your mass is at the bottom. Okay? When we go ahead and look at the bottom of the periodic table, all of those numbers are huge. Whereas we look at the top, they aren't so big. Okay? The next thing we could do is compare the atomic number. What was the atomic number? The number of protons. The number of protons. For those of you being overwhelmed, I didn't tell you that. We're just fishing. Okay, it's the number of protons. Okay, the atomic number is your number of protons. When we look at the bottom, 103 to 262. Okay, that's a big difference. Why is it so different? When we think about how we look at the mass of an atom, what things contribute to the mass? You mean I told you that you had to apply it like immediately? Yes. Both protons and neutrons contribute to mass. So when we go through and look at the mass down here, we're saying we have a lot of neutrons, 162 ballpark here. Okay? If we move further up the periodic table, Okay? It's almost a one-for-one one ratio. Down at the bottom, it ain't one-for-one. One. In fact, I get a lot more neutrons in there than I get up at the top. Okay, why? The neutrons are what's holding it together. The more marbles you put together in that nucleus, the more glue you need to add to hold it together. Okay? Eventually, what happens? You've put so much glue in there that what does that marble glue concoction start to do? No one's tried to glue like 100 marbles together? Just, it just falls apart. Guess what happens with atoms? They fall apart. The exact same thing in the form of nuclear radiation. So if I'm looking at nuclear notation, I'm concerned about nuclear radiation. I'm concerned about 
the size of the nucleus. Well, what things went into the nucleus? Protons and neutrons. Since I'm concerned, looking at nuclear notation about the nucleus, what is the very first piece of information I want to see? The amount of protons and neutrons. Because we are American, for lack of a better descriptor, let's just run with that. How do we read? Right. One letter at a time. Left to right and top to bottom. Where should I place that proton and neutron number? The top left, so that I see that number immediately. Because if that number is big enough, now I can be like, kaboom! That's why the information is there. If we look at the periodic table, it's not written on the upper left, is it? Yeah. No. Why would we write it somewhere else on the periodic table? Do I care about the kaboom with the periodic table? No. I'm only concerned about blowing things up when it becomes nuclear. So the notation of where we place that information will change depending on the information we are trying to highlight. The information with the periodic table that we're trying to highlight is the numerical sequence of the atomic number, ultimately the number of protons. So on the periodic table, the number that I put highest up is the atomic number the notation swaps depending on the audience that's using that information. Kind of make sense? Okay, nuclear notation again, mass number, upper left-hand corner. The mass number is defined as the protons and neutrons. The atomic number is just the number of protons. We'll then follow that with the symbol representing the element. Can someone tell me the mass number for carbon? Look at the periodic table. Don't be like, I'm trying to think of it. No, read off the periodic table. What's the, what's the mass number for the periodic for carbon? 12.01. 12.01. What was part subatomic particles? Dalton said we couldn't divide up atoms, right? Well, protons, neutrons, electrons, at least for us, we're going to say we can't divide them up. So if I'm going to look at a mass number, I can only have whole number protons and whole number neutrons which means the number I get for the mass number will always be a whole number. What did you guys say the mass number was for carbon? 12.01. How, how did I get a fractional proton or neutron? Is the mass number on the periodic table? No. Somebody was being a bit dickish and misleading. It is not the mass number on the periodic table. That is the atomic weight. It is related to the mass number, but it is not the same thing. The mass number is by definition the protons and neutrons. The atomic weight is the average mass number for all isotopes of that element. Very subtle difference in those, so we have to be careful with how we apply that. Okay. Last bit of information. Let's make this atomic notation. To make it atomic notation, what do we have to add to our diagram? We would somehow have to specify information about electrons. Okay. Already told you what to do with it. It has to equal the number of protons. It does not have to equal the number of protons. In the upper right-hand corner, we could specify the charge for the element. What's going to determine the charge for the element? Electron the it's the balance of the electrons and protons. Notice within this notation, we aren't ever explicitly stating the number of neutrons, yet can we determine them? Yes. How? the mass number and atomic number. We can subtract the protons out. For the charge, how do we determine the charge? Well, it's our protons plus our electrons, and ultimately also times 
their charge, because the proton is a plus one and the electrons are a minus one, they would cancel each other out. So just like the mass number, I can determine the number of neutrons, I can also determine the number of electrons when given the charge. Okay? So the charge would get specified in the upper right-hand corner. How many corners are on a square? Four. Cool. How many have we covered? Three. What's in the last corner? Remember when we had that silly conversation about the notation of hydrogen and how we can tell hydrogen and oxygen are a compound versus an element or a compound? There it is. The amount of the atoms gets specified in the lower right-hand corner. We now have an entire system to be able to apply out to everything if we wanted. Okay? When we're concerned about running reactions, how many of you are concerned that in the lab we are going to expose you to radioactive materials? Good. We're not. Okay? Which means, do you care about the protons and neutrons? Probably not, because that number being big means radioactivity. If you're not concerned about radioactivity, why the hell do I want to write the number? Valid point. So let's not worry about that number. Okay. How about the number of protons? Should I write the atomic number every time? So when I write out H2O, this 2 applies to the number of protons in oxygen? Isn't that in the same location as we just specified here? Damn it. What does that 2 mean? The amount of that 2 is referencing the amount. Why does it not apply to the oxygen? It's not in the bottom left of the oxygen for the atomic number? It is. It is. So why is that not the atomic number? Because we had someone say the atomic number is an important thing to include. Write out H2O, was it an important thing to include? No, we decided to not include it. Why are we allowed to not include it? Why is it not needed? Pushing at it. Have I specified the number of protons for this oxygen? No. How many protons does oxygen have? Good eyes. Where'd you look? Where are you looking on the periodic table? Yes. You're looking at the oxygen. What on the oxygen are you looking at? You just thought, oh, that's, he's talking about the periodic table. He's got to be there. That's cool. Someone want to help out. The atomic number. Once I know the symbol, do I know the number of protons? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's already implied, which means our atomic notation that we make you spend this time to learn and memorize and learn, and all that fun stuff, atomic notation, which we said was false, it's not atomic notation, it's nuclear notation. Okay. When we actually go out to make it an atom, what do we do to it? We butcher the hell out of it and remove all the stuff we told you to memorize. Really? Yes. Welcome to chemistry. Okay. The idea is to acknowledge the notations and see some of the value and importance behind them. Depending on the field you're going into, they hold different meanings. Kind of make sense? Seeing the kind of parallels and connections? We're doing big kind of swooping things. Okay, what's the element? Silicon, how do you know it's silicon? Pointing at the periodic table doesn't quite work. You had to memorize the symbol SI meant silicon. That's on you, you have to do it. That's part of our language, we have to talk about it. The atomic number is 14, found in the lower left hand. What does the atomic number represent? The number of protons. The mass number is 29, upper left-hand corner. The atom of silicon has? Protein protons and? 
There's people trying to calculate all the numbers. 15 neutrons, enough neutrons to get us up to that mass. Okay, so we could tack all that information in as calculations to determine each of those constituent parts. Okay, we will pick up, whoop, ignore that, come back, pick up with that little table, the big part on this, that meaning table. That meaning part of the table is something that you should try to identify for yourself. I'll tell you what I think it means on Thursday.